statement about the observer. This is very, very useful in communication. Let's say somebody goes up to you and says, boy, you really look terrible today. Now, the meaning of the message is determined by the receiver, not the sender. Okay, or it's determined by each separate observer. So if somebody says you really look terrible today, there are several ways of interpreting it. Either you, you can take it as objective fact, yeah, you look terrible, and say, okay, well, what's gone wrong, you know? <laughs> or you can say, well, this person is obviously having a bad day. You know, and so you can say, are you not feeling well today? Or uh, is, is, is something disturbing you? So you can take the statement as a statement about the person that made the statement, not as an accurate description that the person made about something else. So every statement is interpreted by each observer. And that's a very handy thing to remember when you're being criticized or whatever. So Heinz von Forster has summarized his point of view uh, in these three statements, which are available on a poster uh, with um, Francisco Varela's uh, symbol of self-reference. Uh, the logic of the world is the logic of descriptions of the world. Okay, so we have descriptions, uh, either verbal or nonverbal, but they're descriptions we've constructed in our nervous system. When we talk about the world, we're talking about a description that we have created in our nervous system based on our experiences. Perception is the computation of descriptions of the world. So we perceive, and during that process, we create a description in our nervous system. Cognition is the computation of computation of computation of computation. So you're constantly reinterpreting what you've perceived in the past. So you're rethinking your thoughts, you're reflecting on your experiences, and you're reinterpreting them, and you're organizing them, either in terms of theoretical constructions, maybe in terms of artistic products like paintings or sculpture. So in terms of therapy, there was a transition from the history of an individual to assuming adaptation to an unusual environment that Freud had the notion that bizarre behavior in the present is the result of traumatic incidents in childhood. And that if a person is behaving in an unusual fashion now, it's because there's something going on in the unconscious mind that's the result of a childhood experience. And that if you can dredge that up from the latent and make it manifest from a forgotten memory to a conscious memory and you can deal with it consciously, then in a sense you can get rid of it. That was the idea underlying therapy. However, uh, people who were dealing with individuals in psychiatric hospitals often observed that a person would be sent to the hospital and then would get well, be, begin behaving normally, be returned to the family, and then relapse. So the idea was that there was something about the family that was causing the person to behave in an unusual fashion. So they decided they needed to deal with the family, and that is what led to family therapy. For example, the family might gang up on one member and say, all our problems are the result of this person. Uh, that's kind of a hard burden to carry, and so it can lead to difficulties. An implication for education or teaching is that if reality is constructed by each individual, then what you want to do in the education process is to facilitate that construction process. You want to help students have experiences from which they can create more complete images of the world. It's not just a matter of rote memorization And then I've talked about the difference between artificial intelligence and learning automata. And I've also mentioned different ways of harmonizing the different realities of the different people in an organization, the finance people, the marketing people, the human relations people, and so forth. All right, so 
this is second order cybernetics. Uh, as we were developing it and promoting it in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Very often, we were told that's nothing new. <laughs> We've known that for a long time. And that's true. There are instances of it. For example, the sociology of knowledge. Going back as far as the mid-1800s, uh, people knew about the interaction between ideas and society. Marx wrote about this. Uh, the idea that what you think about society is a function of your position in society. If you're rich and all your friends are rich, chances are you think that society is working pretty well. If you're poor and your family and friends are poor, chances are you think society is not working very well. So that your position in society influences your conception of society. That's the sociology of knowledge. So that definitely has been around for a while. Then there's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle uh, in physics. The notion that if you disturb an elementary particle uh, or you observe an elementary particle, you change it. Because if you throw a photon at something and what you're observing is an electron, it's kind of like throwing a billiard ball at another billiard ball. You move the object. Uh, and so there's a, a limit that Heisenberg specified of how accurately you can observe an elementary particle. But that only applies for elementary particles. Okay. Now you can say there's a more general uncertainty principle when you're dealing with human beings, but Heisenberg only dealt with elementary particles. Uh, relative velocity, observer and observed in relativity theory. I mentioned that before. The relative velocity is a factor. But what we have been focusing on here is a little bit mathematics, but mostly neurophysiology. And the idea that observations independent of the characteristics of the observer are not physically possible, which violates one of the underlying tenets of the philosophy of science, which was that you could remove the observer. And that's what second order cybernetics has been all about, is to try to include attention to the observer within the domain of science. So this is a little limerick that I wrote uh, in honor of Heinz von Forster once, and it says, if the world is that which I see, and that which I see defines me, and for each is the same, then who is to blame? And is this what it means to be free? Okay, so each person, now the, the way Heinz would explain this is to say that this is a radical interpretation of ethics. You are not only responsible for your actions, you are, respons are responsible for the world as you perceive it because it is the result of the choices that you have made. You have chosen to see things in a particular way. So if you see the world as bad and terrible and so forth, that's a choice you've made. If you see the world as happy and good and etc. That also is a choice that you've made. If you see it as a combination, that's a choice. But the world that you perceive is your own invention. So second order cybernetics is an, an addition to science and the philosophy of science because observers exist in all fields and it is an effort to change society to increase tolerance. The idea being that if you can get people to understand that their conceptions of the world are the products of their own choices, then you move beyond saying, I did this because that is the case. You can no longer say that is the case. You can only say, I choose to believe that that is the case and you value other people because they have different experiences. They can bring you information you don't have. And that gives you a more complete understanding of the world. So that's what we've covered. <clears throat>